The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Arcane Wonders, Game Toppers, catching all the fish in Animal Crossing, and listeners like you. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Future Sean here. Apparently my mic cable is bad. There's some rough patches in the pre-review audio. And then the post-review's audio volume had to be increased significantly. Sorry in advance. We've got the problem fixed for next episode. Coming to you from the Duchy in the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Gateway City, St. Louis, Missouri, it's The Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board card and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes bring in special guest reviewer Abby, my fiancé, to review Azul Summer Pavilion. Then they discuss a new way to assess games, the fitliness to depth ratio. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And also Alex. And this is episode 223, More Than the Summer, It's Parts. More Than the Summer, It's Parts. That title suggestion, thanks to Jimmy DM 90 uh, kind of point off, you know, something be more than the sum of its parts. Of course, we're talking about Azul Summer Pavilion. See the, the plan words Jimmy's got going there? No, it was really solid. That's why we picked it. And then it also kind of ties in with, uh, you know, looking at the fiddliness and depth and, and how that all lends itself to making a good or a bad game, I suppose. So good job, Jimmy. And we've got a bunch of other title suggestions at the bottom of the episode. Are we in the bottom or the top? We're in the top right now, right? We're in the top right now, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. In the yep. bottom of the episode, we get all of our help naming our episodes thanks to our awesome uh, members over on Board Game Geek, our Board Game Geek Guild, guild number 2008. Uh, Alex, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing fine. You seem a little rattled, Sean. I, yeah. No, I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Tell me why. Uh, yeah, no, I'm. I'm pretty stressed out, Alex. I am probably... I am probably the most stressed out I've ever been. Um, this this reminds me of the first month or two after the other attorney who we were kind of running the firm together with left a couple of years ago, like right before I just fully took over. Um, and it's been it's been pretty stressful. I think people that know me well would probably say that I'm somewhat resilient and i don't feel super resilient right now um it's it's very good that i am staying busy and i have plenty of work to do and i'm able to pay my my staff and my employees and that's great and there are many people who can't say that right now um so i'm i'm cognizant of that but i'm working like seven days a week um often very late and i'm kind of overwhelmed because with all of the covid stuff it's creating issues and in custody cases. And I think I, I think I referenced this um, last episode, but it was just kind of getting started. And now there's all of these emergency situations. The courts here in Albuquerque just got shut down for two days because there was a positive case. It's been a stressful time. And when I talk about that resilience, Alex, I, yeah, I can get stressed out, but I just kind of brush it off and just keep going. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very weary, weary, weary. I'm not weary of anything. I'm feeling weary. Well, sometimes it's it's work that you give yourself. For instance, when I when I left to go travel around the world, you decide to make your own life a lot more stressful by trying to do daily video segments and all sorts of other things to kind of right. keep, keep moving things up and having a bunch of guest reviewers and all that kind of stuff. And although I'm sure that stressed you out to a degree, it was stress that you chose. Sure. This is not stress that you chose. This is sure. stress that was forced upon you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. Yeah, so not great, not great at all. I'm doing fine. I'm doing really well. Uh, good. Yeah, Abby and I are in good spirits. We we uh, had the day off today. We're recording this on Good Friday. Uh, happy Good Friday to all those who celebrate it, and Happy Normal Friday to those who are listening to this later and are enjoying a Friday. Uh, we walked to the park. We did a workout together. Abby took a nap. Uh, she's currently playing Animal Crossing over at the couch. Normally she's over in another room uh, while we're recording, but it's fine. She's over there just serving as this uh, audience to only my half of the recording. So uh, I'd have to imagine it's a little bit weird hearing only one half of a podcast for like an hour. So 
but she hasn't gotten sick of me yet, so that's good. I'm sure she's just tuning it out. Yeah, probably. Uh, I will say uh, wedding planning, uh, the big thing, we, we have a wedding coming up in October. That has been completely on hold as a result of this. We don't know which right. caterers are going to still be in business. We don't know whether there's a second wave or what anything really looks like. So that's been the biggest kind of unknown. But I don't know. Working working together at home has been has been smooth and steady and has gone really well. So I'm in a happy spot uh, despite all of this madness in the world. Uh, so I know I know there are others who are are not so fortunate in this moment. Um, and I feel for you. I, I will throw out the offer again like I did last episode. Uh, because I've had conversations with guild members in the meantime, at least a couple, uh, who just want to connect, just wanted to, to chat with someone and kind of use this opportunity to do that. I'm open. Seriously, my my uh, my BGG username is on the guild. I'm easily direct messageable. Um, I'm easy to find, and I will make time. I will make time to connect and, and say hi and visit and chat because I think it's important to, to do so right now. So. Yeah, that's that's how things are going. Uh, grocery store was uh, extra weird today, in that uh, they had finally switched to of the two main entrances to the schnooks here. One of them, um, normally they're both entrances. One of them might close late at night. In this case, one of them was an entrance. One of them was an exit. And there were people kind of sitting up there counting to make sure the store wasn't overloaded. Uh, this was the first time I've been to the grocery store where everyone was wearing masks. A week ago when I went, it was only about half of the people wearing yeah. masks. So. It's been interesting kind of seeing that evolution through through that touch point. So uh but yeah, honestly, I'm I'm in I'm in really good spirits. So I my my heart goes out to those who who are in worse situations, but uh I hope everyone out there is weathering things as best as they possibly can. Uh speaking of which, before we dive too far into anything else, Sean, the Dukes of Diet. Yeah. Uh I'm down a pound. <laughs> hey. Well, hey. It's something. Uh, last time I was at 260, uh, I'm currently at 259, and if you recall, the lowest I'd gotten was 254, um, and so it had been kind of frustrating to have plateaued and also gone up. I'd hit like 267 at one point, briefly, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, the snacks are still there, I'm trying to be better, um, I've gotten into a more, um, my workout routine has gotten a little bit more um, routine-ish. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I've had a I've had a row machine for a long time. I hadn't really used it. Been pulling that out. So I'm doing this whole like row machine kettlebell thing. Uh, I've been pretty consistent with it. There we go. Consistent. That's the word I'm looking for. So it's it's something. It's not great. I think I'm I've decided not to totally beat myself up right now. Um, and as long as I'm not gaining. And as long as I'm at least maintaining, um, I think I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be satisfied with that. Not to say that I'm just like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, our scale's broken, so I have no idea oh. how I'm doing on this, but I think I'm fine. We've been working out pretty consistently. Food's been a mix of stuff we cook here and stuff that uh, we get brought in via DoorDash. So it's been fine. I forgot to mention, I, I recently celebrated a very bizarre birthday on Wednesday. Yes. Happy belated. Thank you. Thank you. 31 years old now. Uh, how old were you when we started the podcast? Uh, 33? 30. Are you, are you almost 40? Hold on. I'm going to be... What, this will be our sixth anniversary in August? Yeah. Um, so I will, I will be 39. So 33. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm not quite at that interesting. All right. Weird. That's weird to think about still. There's a... There's, there's a yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I don't know either. <laughs> anyway. No, I, I will say uh, uh, the birthday went well. I, I kind of posted on Facebook that, uh, let's see, a few years back, I was in Australia for, uh, for my birthday. Then uh, first year I met Abby, a few weeks after knowing Abby, we went to New Orleans together. Then for my 30th, we were in Peru. And for my 31st, the furthest we could go, travel-wise, uh, was my island in Animal Crossing. And that's, that's about it. So... Yeah. Uh, but we made the most of it. She she woke up early and uh, hung up some wonderful decorations out here in our kind of shared office space. Uh, there's a restaurant in town called Stone Soup Cottage, which is doing a delivery dinner type of service. It's uh, $75 a person. They deliver in a three-course meal and then give you some extra instructions for how to kind of do the final preparations and get it heated properly. Uh, but they also provide a bottle of wine that they've hand-selected, a nice bottle of wine, stemware, linens, and a candle. So that you have a nice kind of fancy fine dining experience 
uh, all at the comfort of home. And then you leave the linens and everything else in a little box that it comes in, and then they come scoop it off your front porch the next day. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it worked out well. They have to make two trips out. Hmm. They do. That's they why really, it costs so much. They really want those linens back. But, uh, and I will tell you, uh, they, they are decently far away from us. I think they're a 40-minute drive from, from where we live. So not a small feat for them to do this, but um, I don't know. It was, it was tasty, and it was a good way to celebrate. So had a very enjoyable birthday. Well, that's yeah. good. But we do talk about games. on. Well, let's not talk about games, Alex. Let's not talk about games. What? Yeah, let's not talk about games. You, did you forget? You forgot. What did I forget? Oh my goodness, it's happening. We're repeating last year all over again. What? The Golden Geek Awards. Oh no! <laughs> that was so close. Whew. Okay. All right. Okay, <sighs> so right now, <sighs> over on Board Game Geek, the Golden Geek nominations are open. and I think they're open until uh, March 17th. Not March. That wouldn't make any sense. Hey, sorry. Wow. April 17th. <laughs> yes. So April 17th is correct. And of course, there's a bunch of different categories for different board games. There's also a category for the best board game podcast. And every year um, since we started, uh, or I think, no, I think we didn't. The first year we weren't nominated. First the year second, we were way too small for that. Second year we were nominated. We, and we were nominated for every year since, except for last year. And the problem was it completely flew under our radar last year. We did nothing to promote it. Like the nomination period came and went and we didn't say a word on the podcast. We didn't say a word to the guild, a word on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. We, and we didn't get nominated. So yeah. um, this year we're remembering one of us is at least. I mean, I remember <laughs> to tell you and then I forgot. And then you remember just now. Yeah. So between our two brains, one of us has it in their mind at any given moment. Yes, there you go. That works. So yeah, if you want to go over to Board Game Geek, there, uh, th there's a thing you can click to go over to the Board Game Geek Golden Geek Awards. Uh, if you also go to our guild page, uh, we have a thread there. Also our Twitter page, it's pinned to the top. Um, and it kind of shows you how to do it. It even shows a picture with highlights of, hey, here's where you click Dukes of Dice and here's where you click Best Podcast. So... We would greatly appreciate that. And also, you can nominate multiple uh, podcasts. So I highly suggest that you nominate not just us, uh, if, if you would you know, think to nominate us, but also some of your other favorite board game podcasts, because there are a lot of great ones out there that all deserve attention. So, But specifically Draft Mechanic. I hope they do really well. Yeah, absolutely. And oh, uh, and so our friends over at Boards Alive also have a brand new podcast. So they kind of, they kind of, back on their main their main podcast their flagship podcast and they, they're still doing other stuff on their on their um in their feed but they've started aaron and Lindsay have started a brand new podcast that's not board game related but i highly suggest you take a listen to it so if you look up cult classic callback that's cult classic callback they dropped their first four episodes this last week uh the first episode is actually with suzanne sheldon our, our good friend and basically it's Kind of interesting, Alex, because you fit in this category where there are weird cult classic or maybe retro stuff uh, where you have like gaps in knowledge. And so Aaron and Lindsay are kind of that same way. So they're bringing on guests to talk about it. Um, so like this first episode with Suze is about Xena Warrior Princess. Alex, I guess I'm guessing, you know, next to nothing about Z Xena Warrior Princess. I, I, I know it exists. I have seen no nothing, nothing of it. Know nothing. I know nothing about Xena. Okay. Well, you can go listen to this episode with all of our friends and uh, learn a little bit more about it and learn how passionate Suze is about Xena. I feel like I should probably just watch the show and then maybe go do that. Probably in that order. Um, or, or you could support our friends and listen to their <laughs> podcasts. So, well, yeah. I'm still supporting them. It's just a delayed effect. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, the, the first four episodes have dropped. I, I've only had a chance to listen to the first one so far. I was hoping to listen to uh, the others this weekend. We'll see if that works. But uh, it was enjoyable. Aaron and Lindsay are lots of fun. And of course, Suze is lots of fun. So definitely go check out Cult Classic Callback. All right, Alex. Oh, no. One other thing. Oh, no. Did okay. you forget? Did you forget, Sean? Uh, happy birthday. I no, said that. not that. Um, we're running a contest. Oh, we're running a contest. We're going to be running a contest on our guild uh, right around when this episode drops. It'll be 
live until probably the next episode drops is I think how long we'll do this. Wait, it is on the guild? Uh, yeah, we'll do it on the guild. First we said the guild, and then you're like, no, not the guild. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, before no. the episode, we did have several possibilities, but it's definitely going to be on the guild. Uh, if you want to listen for more details, those details will be either on the guild, or you can listen to the ad midway through the show. And we'll tell you what you could possibly win from our friends over at Game Toppers, LLC. It ain't a bopper if it's not a Game Topper. That's not their actual slogan. Anyway, let's games? talk about games. Sort of? <laughs> Is it? All right, let's talk about games. What have you been playing, Sean? I, I have been playing a lot of old stuff. A lot of old stuff that, uh, let's see, a lot of Keyflower, a lot of Innovation, uh, Six Nymph, Roll for the Galaxy. Actually, so here's what I will talk about. Uh, Alex, you missed out on D&D Night with Aaron, Suze, and Lindsay, but actually Lindsay was working, so we wound up playing some board games on Board Game Arena. We played Roll for the Galaxy, Six Nymphed, and Red Seven, and I'm just, just to be clear, I'm, I'm checking my uh, Board Game Plays app. What's this called? I can't remember the name of this. BG Stats. Board Game Stats, yeah. BG Stats, there you go. And uh, let's see, Roll for the Galaxy, uh, oh, I won that. Six Nymphed was won by, uh, oh, that's me also. And then, oh, I shut everyone out in Red Seven. So, wow. just saying, uh, you know. Wow. It's just, it's it's good to be good. Good to be good at board games. I'm I'm really not. I'm really not good at board games. You're I used to be. That. I don't think you actually believe yourself when you're saying that. No, my my win percentage. I feel like when I first started board gaming, my win percentage was like super high, um, such that like it was always oh if there's someone to attack, attack Sean, right? But that's definitely not not nearly the case anymore. Not not even not really. I I do remember that early in the days of the podcast it would be a true privilege and an honor to defeat you because it was very difficult to do so. Yes. And then as the years went on and we played more games together, it, it just, I still wanted to beat you, but mm -hmm. it just wasn't as, as hard of a thing to do. So yeah, it really, it really isn't. I, I think, I think old age has, has started to, to soften your skills, sir. It could be. It definitely could be. Um, let's see. Played Colorado. I have played a ton of Russian railroads. I played some Zolkin. So really, I mean, nothing, nothing new to talk about. It's kind of, um, I don't know. Um, I, did I talk, I talked about playing combat commander on Vassal, right? Yeah, I did talk about that. Mm. Uh, still playing around the Vassal. I have had a Tabletopia account for a while. I've had that on Steam and I just downloaded uh, or, or just started up a game of Nemo's War, which is supposed to be a good solo game. I still need to go through the rules. Um, and then we may, I don't know, we may play around with, with Tabletop Simulator. Uh, but it's, it's, been, it's been interesting playing a bunch of games that I already know, not having to hustle to, for new plays for the podcast. So it's been interesting. Well, I know at least for our, for our next episode, what, what's in store also won't require new plays, but a good refresh of, of older games in the, in the pipeline. But I will say, despite the fact that I, I don't have any intention or didn't have any intention of trying new things, I ended up getting new things in anyway. Uh, now, I played some old stuff as well. So uh, we've been running a couple of Dukes of Dice tournaments. Uh, one of those was, I believe it was won by Nick, uh, Nick McKenzie. Um, but it's not, I don't think that's actually his name. It's Nick MC and then NZ because he's from New Zealand. Uh, and we ended up playing a game of Castles of Burgundy live, uh, which he knit me in. Uh, that was in the semifinals. And then he ended up, I believe, winning that whole thing. Uh, but there's also been a Targi tournament under underway. Uh, met a met a lovely lovely gentleman from uh, from Belgium, and I don't want to try and mispronounce his name, but it would be something along the lines of Wouter or Wouter. Uh, but anyway, he he was uh, incredibly kind, and it's been great connecting with uh, with folks that way. Uh, I've been playing some old classics with Abby recently. I played for the first time in a long time, and Sean, I had to go to the basement to dig this out. Oh. I had to go to the basement because it was there, and it didn't really deserve to be there, but it was there anyway. My copy of Pandemic was in the basement. Oh. Along with the expansion. And it was one that it had occurred to me, sure, there's a thematic tie to the, to the world we're in. That's an old joke, whatever else. But, but moreover, it's a game that I thought Abby would really love. It was one of the games that I had initially played when I was getting into board gaming. And so because of the cooperative nature of it, because um, of that kind of puzzliness. She loves puzzliness in, in her games. I thought it would be one that we could really have a lot of fun with together. And sure enough, 
We did. We played on uh, easy mode first to kind of learn the game, and then we played on uh, standard difficulty. We won both times. And uh, yeah, it got on the Abbey scale, which is kind of like the Dukes of Dice scale, but has different things associated with the numbers, uh, as we'll talk about in the review a little bit later on. Uh, this one got a yeah on the, on the scale, which, cool. is, which is about a five. So pretty good. Pretty good for, for Abby. Uh, and then we also played Targi the other night. That one was enjoyable. I don't think she, she's quite as head over heels for that one, but uh, one of my favorite two-player games. It's just, just stellar. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so that was good. We also played brand new last night, Sean. So every now and then, Facebook ads can be really effective. Deepwater Games, who makes Welcome 2, was running one. They had a deep discount on a bundle of all their Welcome 2 stuff. So they had dry erase player boards. They had a nice neoprene mat. And they had, I think, four or five of the different, uh, of the different boards, the special expansion boards you can get for Welcome 2. And so we tried our first one last night, and we played Welcome 2 Zombie Edition. Now, for folks who don't know uh, what Welcome 2 is, it is a flip and fill game. Uh, or a rando writer. Uh, it's not really a roll and write. There aren't dice, but it's that style of game. Uh, how the normal game works is each turn, there will be three different things flipped up. There will be a number and then a special ability associated with that number. You pick one of those numbers to write on your street. The numbers have to increase uh, left to right. You're trying to get the most points from different combos of things you're doing. Uh, it's a stellar game. It's, it's honestly, it, it is a six. That game is a six for me. It is really good and really enjoyable and infinitely expandable. It plays a large uh, a number of people. Uh, the zombie edition of this one, Sean, is pretty cool. So what it does is in one of the three stacks of cards, you add in kind of evenly spaced out these zombie cards. And as soon as they're revealed, zombies will start running down all three of the streets from either the left, the right, or the left and the right at the same time. And you can spend bullets, which are a resource you can get on the real estate track to stop them from moving. Um, when you're building fences, you can build barricades. But if you let them kind of move down the street, which they will at some point, they'll move until they find an empty spot in the barricade, and then they'll invade whatever's in that house. <laughs> and then you draw fences on both sides to quarantine it. So it kind of kicks out whatever that number is, if there was huh. a number. And then it replaces that with a Z and two walls. The interesting effect of this is it can help you add fences in a, in a weird way in this game. But it's also the first game of Welcome 2 I've ever played where neither player accomplished any of the goals, any of the one, two, or three goal in this one. Um, it just didn't happen. Uh, some of it was poor planning and not realizing the mechanics of how the zombies were going to interact. And some of it is because there's some amount of tension in this game where you're trying to kind of figure out how these all lock into place. Uh, yeah, the, the game adds new goal cards, it adds those zombie cards, and a whole new uh, player sheet to play on. Ton of fun. Great twist on Welcome 2. Enjoyed it a lot. Excited to try the other ones and kind of weigh the pros and cons, but at least this one specifically was one I would definitely recommend. Um, Sean, any other things you were talking about? I don't want to just kind of keep rambling on through, but I didn't know what else you might have had. So yeah, actually, you refreshed my recollection um, oh. when you mentioned Pandemic. I don't think I mentioned this in the last episode. Did I? We're playing Pandemic Legacy? No, I don't think you mentioned that at all. Yeah, so I had picked up... Uh, so we had played Pandemic Legacy, and we'd only gotten through, what, like July, August? Somewhere it was in you, there, and it, it was, was one of the coolest moments I, I can ever remember in games happened in the very last play of that, and we were excited to continue, and then we never continued. It was you, me, Matt, and Matthew? Matt. Right? Yeah, it was yeah. Matt. yeah, it was the mats and you and me. Yep. And so I had said, you know what? I really want to pick up another copy because at some point I want to play this with Raquel and Mariah and maybe Chewy, but but we've we've already ended that. So I picked it up and I've it's just been sitting on my shelf for like three three years, maybe more. And with everything going on, I said, Mariah, this has been some of the coolest gaming experiences in my life. Do you want to try this? And she had actually never played Pandemic. I, I didn't realize that. I thought she had oh, played. Really? Yeah, she had never played Pandemic. And so we have played uh, five, five games. No, six games now. Uh, six games through April. We've lost two. Um, and so for those that don't know, it's, it's Pandemic, but Legacy. So this is where Matt Leacock, Rob Davio teamed up. Um, and we reviewed this a long time ago. And, and there's probably, I mean, this is season one, by the way, there's, there's season two, uh, but basically the game will change. Rules will change. Things will get ripped up. Stickers will get added to the board. 
don't want to spoil anything. Uh, it's interesting because it's been so long. There were there were certain high points that I would remember, but I also forgot a lot. And I've been um, I've been working in such a way that I'm not trying to lead people down paths where I know where, what could happen or might happen. I want I'm letting them kind of make the decisions as far as long term things. So it you know because I kind of remember some of what we saw, right? right. Not everything. Uh, so yeah, it's been fun. We've we've enjoyed it. It's we've had some really tense, some really tense moments. Um, and then, well, I guess I don't want to say anything because I've told you what month we're through. So it's been fun, and I'm looking forward to hopefully getting some more plays of it this weekend. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so I have uh, also been getting in some other virtual gaming experiences. Uh, one of those, I got to play cartographers for the first time. Just played that the other day. That's uh, another one of these. Uh, kind of a card flips up from the deck and then you'll draw on a map. You'll have different terrain types, different ways of scoring. It felt very much uh, kind of Isle of Sky-esque. Uh, it's set in the role-player universe. Uh, I don't know if it was designed by Keith Matejka offhand. Uh, that one was fun. We played that using Google Docs. And uh, whenever monsters flip up in that game, you would kind of click over to the tab to the right or to the left and fill in a monster on the board. Have you played Cartographers yet, Sean? I haven't, no. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, it's, it's just something where a card will flip up each round and it will have a shape that you need to draw on your map. And uh, it will either be uh, one shape and two terrain type options, or it will be uh, one terrain type option, but two different shapes. Or it'll be other things like monsters, which you draw on your other sheet to uh, mix stuff up and mess up your opponent. Uh, so that's another thing that, that pops up in that one. Uh, so that was fun to play on Zoom. We also played just one as part of that same game night. Ton of fun. The one I want to talk about, though, in a little bit more depth, is The Crew. And this is a game that I had been told I would really like. It's a cooperative trick-taking game. And as folks who don't like the mind, who are wrong, by the way, say, it's the mind if it were fun. And... Uh, I, I don't quite pick up on that having played it virtually just yet. Um, how it works is you are a space crew. You are a space crew and you need to work together to solve missions. Uh, how this will work is each round there will be a task that will be assigned. And there's a whole series of different missions. I don't know how many there are in total. Um, but there will be things like, okay, the red four must be won by this specific player. And so you have to work through the trick-taking mechanism that, that you would typically find in a game to get that player a red four. So uh, that's one, one mission. There'll be other things like, okay, these there are two tasks, two cards you have to win, but they're in a different order. So you have to win, uh, this player has to win the blue five, and then this player has to win the red four. Or there'll be some missions that you have to pick one player who's sick, and that player can't win any tricks, or you lose the mission immediately. The missions ramp up in difficulty, uh, they change they change depending on what's what's happening. I have been playing this through Tabletop Simulator with uh, BJ from Board Game Gumbo's crew. They call it Space Gumbo. Uh, they've created a custom background that's Bourbon Street. That's like a, 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 <laughs> a picture of Bourbon Street that kind of surrounds you as you play this. And the cards themselves are these custom cards with uh, different folks' faces from that gaming group. <laughs> and it was it's a really cool mod that they've that they've done that uh, captures the feel of this game. Played it a couple of times. It is completely frustrating when someone makes a a dumb play. So so as part of this as part of this game in most rounds, you're allowed to communicate one piece of information one time. You take a card out of your hand and you can communicate whether that card is the highest of that suit you have, the lowest of that suit you have, or the only of the suit that suit you have. So it's a way of kind of giving others more information so that you have can better steer cards where they need to go. It it works really well. It, it So I played two cooperative trick-taking games in my life. I played this one, and I played Fox in the Forest Duet. And this one smacks the pants off of Fox in the Forest Duet, in my wow. opinion. I don't think it would play too well at two players. In fact, I'm not sure it's designed that way. Um, we've been typically playing it at four or five when I've been playing it so far. Three would seem a little bit eh, boring to me but four or five has the potential to be pretty interesting. It's one that when it's available, when it's more widely available, I'm going to pick up a copy. I'm going to play this, uh, and it's one I'm excited to play. It definitely has um, 
high potential to, to be one that I'll really, really like in person. It's just hard to get a full gauge of it just playing on Tabletop Simulator, talking through Discord right now. So, yeah, a ton of new plays. That's, that's, that's kind of two and a half. Two uh, cartographers, that, and uh, an expansion for Welcome To. So, I don't know. I'm still getting some new plays in despite the, the weirdness going on in the world, Sean. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's what we played this week. Because the news is just so dang depressing, and folks, folks are just absorbed by it. And look, there's some good things happening in the board game space. I've seen some charitable efforts. I've seen uh, there was there was uh, one company that that is uh, taking proceeds of online sales they have and and donating them to a friendly local game store of the person who buys that game's choice. Couple couple companies actually, both Plaid Hat and Arcane Wonders is doing that. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's a fantastic way to support brick and mortar stores that may have already been struggling and now get hit by this complete and utter shockwave. Uh, so there's some positive things happening for sure. There's some negative things happening. I don't want to dive too far into it, Sean. I don't know about you. Yeah, eh. no, we're good. We're good. All right, cool. So that'll do it for what we played. After this short break, we'll come back with our featured review of the week, featuring not Sean, not for, not for any NPC-related D&D disputes, but just because of, you know, I had a copy of the game handy and Abby played it. Uh, a review featuring myself and Abby, my fiance. Well, Sean, in these in these uh, tricky times, our friends at Game Toppers want to let folks know that uh, they're they're still open for business. They're still doing what they can to provide some at home gaming goodness to help people upgrade their gaming experience while they're trapped at home. So, Late Pledge Manager is open on Game Toppers. They have a lot of great bundles on their website. Uh, some of which might sell out, so check it out before uh, before it gets too late. Uh, also, mats are going to be able to be shipped out relatively soon, so if that's something you've been looking for, hey, great. Wait, speaking of mats, Alex. Yeah, I was going to say, we have something very special that Game Toppers uh, has offered us to uh, be able to do. So the Game Topper mats are these three millimeter thick premium mats. They're woven around the edges, so they're not going to fray. And our buddy Berkey gave us one that we can give away to one of our amazing listeners. Specifically, it's one of the dungeon mats, which adds a nice little ambiance to your dungeon crawl game of choice. And this fits the Watson table. So give us the size specifications, Alex. It's 38 by 60 inches. <laughs> Perfect. 38 by 60 feet. And if you don't get a 38 by 60 foot mat, <laughs> tell Berkey what, what's the deal, man. Um, Inches, inches. So, Alex, how are we going to give this one away? Well, Sean, if you go to our Board Game Geek Guild, we are going to have a thread there. And all you have to do, if you want to be entered, is to write a comment on the thread. It could be any comment. It could be, I want to enter. It could be, Alex, you stink at, at Baseball Highlights 2045, first mention. It could be any number of different things. All you have to do, though, is find that thread on the com on our, on our Board Game Geek Guild Subscribe to it while you're there. Hey, maybe even participate in a naming contest or join in the discussions. Uh, but yeah, all you have to do to be entered is enter in a comment on that thread on the Board Game Geek Guild. I will say this, though. Uh, unfortunately, due to shipping requirements, eligibility is only in the U.S. and Canada for this contest. And this contest is going to close at noon central time on April 23rd. We'll be recording the podcast that night. Uh, so a little over a week and a half. So hurry as soon as you listen to this episode to go get a chance uh, to enter into this week contest. Thanks to Game Toppers for supporting the podcast and for supporting gamers looking to upgrade their gaming experience. So go visit them at GameToppersLLC.com. In these tough times, Arcane Wonders is doing what they can to try and make sure folks can still get their gaming fix while supporting their friendly local game stores. They are offering a discount on their website, and Sean, with that discount, they're doing something pretty cool. Yeah, so if your local game store refers you to Arcane Wonders, or if you just like to help them out, you can enter their name, city, uh, and state in the comment section of the order, and they're gonna reach out to them and send them 25% of the total purchase price. There is no reason Arcane Wonders has to do that, other than realizing, hey, these stores help the community. They help our, you know, promote our products. So this is a fantastic way that they're helping out your friendly local game store. So check out all of their great discounts. Again, everything's 25% off. Just go to arcanewonders.com and check out all of their latest games. Also, Late Pledge is still open for Foundations of Rome. 
It's only springtime here in the Northern Hemisphere, but that doesn't mean we can't take a look ahead to a game with summer splashed all over it. The third game in the Azul series, Azul Summer Pavilion. But is this third part in the trilogy more like a Return of the Jedi, or is it more of a Godfather Part 3? We'll tell you. Godfather part <laughs> You haven't seen any of the Godfather parts, in fact. It's fair, but I also haven't seen Godfather Part 3. Cool. I have, and I think folks who've seen the Godfathers will get the reference, but it's possible it's not the best reference. Yeah, I'm just letting you know that's, that's not an all-inclusive. Oh, we're, by the way, this is all staying in. <laughs> this is yeah, thank, thank you for letting me know my reference is bad. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, so hi, everyone. As you heard just moments ago, that's Abby, not my girlfriend. Abby, my fiance, and I remember from comments from last time that I need to say it as if it's with a comma in there so people so people don't react to that. I don't know. The way you said, Abby, not my girlfriend. We broke up. Like, no. I, like that's kind of how it <laughs> felt like that was going. It's not the case. No. It went to another level. We're very close now. We're spending <laughs> all hours together. <laughs> How like is that? Quarantine. Wait, so before we get into the review, because clearly we're off to a great start in terms of talking about board games. Yeah. Uh, how, how has that been, I, from from my perspective, I've actually thought it's been pretty great. Yeah. How, have, how have you liked it? Yeah, quarantine with my quarantine, not bad. What is it like to be with me for 24 hours a day? I mean, very similar to being with you for three or four hours a day. Okay. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but every day at 2.30, I try to get you to sit down and have gossip hour with me where we just take a break from work and talk and you don't. That's fair. So it's not like you're like in my face and in my <laughs> business. Like when you're working, you're like focused on work and that's all you do. You don't really talk much during the day. It's very similar to us like working in separate places, only I can like look over my monitors and be like, hi. Yeah. That's about it. And we do. Yeah. Yeah, we can go over and give you a little snuggle. We get each other tea. We get each other coffee. Make make lunch. Anyway, this is all I'm sure very fascinating yes. to folks curious about board games yeah. and uh, and how they go. Because no one else is doing this quarantine thing, so yeah. no one knows what it's like. <laughs> all right. So as mentioned in the intro, Azul Summer Pavilion, uh, third game in the Azul series. There was Azul, then there was Azul Stained Glass of Sintra, and now Azul Summer Pavilion. Uh, in Azul Summer Pavilion. It uses the same kind of Azul drafting mechanics. If you haven't played Azul yet, uh, I'll kind of run through what those are. Basically, you have a number of discs. Uh, they're called factory displays that will vary depending on player count, but at the start of each round, they will have four different things on them. In the case of this, they're sort of diamond building tiles is the best way I can describe them. You have four of them. They're randomly drawn out of a bag on each of them, and then you'll take turns drafting. And how this draft works is you're going to pick one of those displays or the center of the table, and you're going to take all of one color and then add that to kind of your building area in front of you. Stuff, resources you have to build with later. That's the core Azul thing. And basically anything left behind on that tray gets shoved into the middle, which is then an area you can draft from. What makes Azul Summer Pavilion different is in Azul Summer Pavilion, each round, one of the six different types of these diamond, top, diamond shaped tiles are wild. And you can't just take a group of wilds all at once. So when you take, though, from an area that has a wild on it, you'll take all of the color that you want and then one additional wild with that. So a bit of a different structure, but kind of the core of this is the same. After every single tile is drafted, whether it was something useful to you or not, then you go into a building phase. And in that building phase, one at a time, you'll go back and forth um, playing out tiles. So on your board, you have these seven different stars, and the stars have six different wedges in them numbered one through six, for the most part. There's a variant board that changes that up a little bit, but for the most part, num numbered one through six. Uh, the stars themselves also have a color that they're designated to, except for the middle one, which is sort of a, a catch-all multicolored star. You have to have everything has to be different on that star. Uh, how this is gonna work is, let's say I had two purple tiles. Uh, a better example would be if I had three purple tiles. I could either uh, basically burn two of them to this tower that comes in the game and then place the purple one on purple three, or I could burn one of those and place it on purple two, and or just play the one by itself and it's just a purple one. It's pretty much the same number of points no matter which level you're building on. 
Uh, the scoring in this is very streamlined, as we'll talk about later, but basically you'll get one point for the tile itself, and then one point for everything else it's touching within that star. So if I happen to have other two other pieces of that star and then laid down the three and it was connected, uh, that would get me three points. Scoring again, much more streamlined. We'll talk about it later. Uh, as you complete certain areas on the board, as you surround certain areas, you'll get bonus tiles that you'll grab from a little central area. So if I complete the five and the six in any one star, uh, then I'll get to take three of those tiles. If I complete uh, some of the ones more in the middle, it's two. And then if I use something with the multicolored star in the middle and the outside, it's that. We're gonna play through six rounds, uh, cycle through all of the different wilds, tally up our score at the end of the game. Score will consist of uh, basically points for completed stars. Uh, you'll also get points if you've filled out every one of the fours or threes or twos or ones, plus any scores you've racked up over the course of the game. Uh, and that's it. That's pretty much it. Oh, and you'll lose points for any extra tiles you grab at the very end, but that's usually doesn't make a ton of difference in this game. So that is Azul Summer Pavilion in a nutshell. I'm no Sean when it comes to describing rules, but hopefully that was easy enough to follow along with. So, Abby, first place we are starting with this review is expectations. When you saw I brought home Azul Summer Pavilion, borrowed it from Jamie right before the quarantine uh, went into effect, what were your expectations of this game? What were your hopes, fears? How are you feeling going in? I mean, I felt fine. I wasn't <laughs> particularly <laughs> worried about it. Uh... Yeah, I liked the other two Azuls. We have one of the Azuls. Uh, I I wonder if they, they regret not naming original Azul. Azul. Something. Something in addition to Azul. Azul factory, this, I don't know, yeah. tile factory or something. Yes. Yeah. Just because, you know, now you now everyone has a second name except for OG Azul. Um, but I've also, I've liked all of them. So I wasn't thinking that this would be a, a disappointing adventure. And I wasn't like, oh, I don't want to learn a new game. So I felt good about it. I was excited to play it. Uh, we sat down and played it like three times right in a row once we did sit down to play it because I wanted to beat you. And I was very close <laughs> to beating you the second time. And so we had to go for the third time. Yeah, you made you made a bad decision that kind of let you down in, in that one. <sighs> one blue tile. I was one blue tile away from beating you. We'll get, we'll get to this. Um, I, I will say for, for my expectations, before I played this for the first time, not with you, but when I played it over at Jamie's, uh, my expectations were, were reasonably high. I mean, the Azul series from the get-go has been a staple. It, is, it has proven itself pretty worthy, and it, and it showed with Sintra that it was able to put a nice twist on that core concept and have it feel different, have it feel unique. So I had heard only good things going in, and I was optimistic that this could be a pretty worthy entry in the series too. But of course, there's always some fear of, is it going to feel too similar or too, or too samey to some of the other entries? So there was a little bit of that thought in my head, but I, I overall was similar to you. I was expecting good things going into this one. Yeah. So let's talk rule book. Uh, I don't think you had to reference the rule book much at all. But in terms of explanation and learning the game, how easy was this to learn compared to, say, original Azul or other games? Um, easier. I think uh, compared to original Azul, it's probably about similar. Compared to the stained glass one, it's a little bit more fiddle. That version is a little more fiddly. This is a little more streamlined and a little smoother and easier to, to get from the get-go. Um, I... Do not recall ever looking at a rule book, um, but I also don't recall ever looking at a rule book during any other game we've played. So it's not usually your thing. No. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so I will say for my part, I didn't have to learn this game from the rule book. I had this game taught to me initially, but I did have to reference some things in the rule book afterward. And I will tell you, for the most part, it does a great job. It's it's six pages. Graphics are clean and clear. Plan B tends to do a pretty good job with its rule books. I do have one nitpick that kind of, it's sort of an art components thing. It's sort of a rule book thing. It's kind of a disagreement between the two, but it was with the variant play with this alternate board. So mm -hmm. the boards themselves, it comes with two ways to play. You can play with a more closed off version of it where uh, the colors are set, the multicolored thing in the center is set. Uh, and then there's another version on the back side of that where you have more flexibility. You can have all of the same color of star if you want. You can have a bunch of multicolored stars. You can kind of choose your path and dictate your way. The variant play section, it's on the very last page of the rulebook, spells it out and I think is sort of clear enough. 
but there's a disagreement with the look of the game. As they, as they describe multicolored stars, the ones in the center of your player board, they describe that as, as scoring 12 points. Well, they have a multicolored star that looks the same in the center of your player board, but under the strict reading of the rules, it says during the game, you have the choice of which colors you place in the star shapes, parentheses, for all seven stars, which implies you could have a solid shape, a solid star in the middle, even though that contradicts with that. And it would have been simple enough, I think, to have that center star if they want to have it look different from the outside ones, fine, but don't have it look like the multicolored star that's on the other side of the board that just confuses how scoring works. It led to a little misunderstanding for you in our play of this when we had the variant up. Um, and I don't know, again, if that's a fault of the rule book, I, more of a fault of the graphic design. So uh, generally speaking, it's a six page rule book. It gets the job done. No major issues. It, it's, it looks good. It, it, yeah, it got us going, got, kept us playing pretty well for the most part. Yep. Uh, it's Azul. It's there's not a ton, there's not a ton to mess up here, right? There's not a ton of little corner cases or edge cases or weird things that come up. So it's not a particularly hard game rules wise, and a lot of the rules are reinforced or referenced on your player boards themselves. Yeah, and it's you're it's very repetitive, so you kind of get it. Yeah, yeah, it's easy enough to just get. So let's talk art and components. How does this game look on the table to you? Is it eye-catching? Is it your style? What are we talking here? It looks nice. The pieces are nice. They're different from the other Azul pieces, which are squares. These are sort of like skinny diamonds. Um, and the colors are all very nice. The only one that I don't like so much is the yellow. It's like very muted and kind of like dirty looking compared to the others that are really bright and vibrant and look really nice um, on the boards. Um they have a nice weight to them that all the Azul tiles have, which I really like. Um, this one is nice as well because like the stained glass one, it comes with a tower to put your sort of trash tiles into, which makes it easier for dumping and refilling the bag when you run out of tiles and it fits the theme of the game. I'd say my only complaint is the one that you just brought up, which is the back version of the board that is much less colorful. And I think they tried to help ease that, but could lead to some confusion. I have some additional complaints in this section. So let me go back and say, broadly speaking, I like the look of this game. Those tiles feel really satisfying to hold. It's a high quality of component. The bag that they give you is really nice. The tower is really nice. The disc that they come on, it's all thick enough. It's all, it's all of a good quality. So I don't have any complaints about that, but it's little fiddly things that are, that are inherent in it. For instance, the four player colors that they chose are, and I'm looking at the board to refresh my recollection here, we have uh, tan, mm -hmm. we have white, we have gray, and we have black. Now those are fine, you can mostly distinguish them all right. My big issue is the way that they distinguish the player boards themselves, so that you know which color you are, is in this little teeny tiny circle up at the very top. And I get that they don't want to ruin the other beautiful graphic design elements that they have on this board. But to me, I think you could have made the top, even that top little chunk there, all Maybe white or all black all the chunks. or all the chunks or, or make it easier to determine what, who's, who's what player color, especially because the scoring track is all kind of bunched together. Yeah. The other little kind of knick knacky kind of two little, two little other ones. Uh, the scoring track itself, it's easy enough to kind of bump and lose a place. If you send a tile skittering across, it can knock that thing loose. It's not the worst one of these I've seen, but it's it's not like great that's either. That's the same on most other Azuls. Yeah, and I think it's a problem on most other Azuls too. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that part of it is done super well. Uh, I will say also, I, I love the little patterns that they have on, say, the orange and the blue and the green. And for some reason, on three of those colors, on the purple, yellow, and red... They don't have any of those other little patterns included. They do that on the plain Azul, too. I don't like it there either. <laughs> I'm not saying it's special to this edition. I'm just saying these are things that are nitpicky. I will say overall, though, again, high quality of components uh, and the look of that board, especially as you're filling it in with the star shapes, looks really pretty. Yeah. It's, it's one of the best. I think it's, to me, it's the best looking of the three Azuls as a whole. I really like the pieces in the stained glass one, the Jolly Rancher pieces. They look really cool. Um, but yes, this one is my favorite of the Azuls. From just look? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Let's talk 
gameplay. And you mentioned when we first played this, and this is usually a good sign for your enjoyment of a game. It's also pretty much what's happened with any Azul I've introduced you to. We play it once, then we play it a second time, and then we play it a third time. It happens almost every time we break out an Azul. Um, what is it about this game system that, that hooks in and, and has you want to play it again and again? Because that's not the case for other games. No, always. it's definitely not the case for other games. Um, well, usually we play it once and you really win by a lot of points. And that's because I'm just like figuring out my strategy and figuring out how I want to play and what to do. And then, so then the second one, I'm like, all right, I get it now. I can beat you. And then I can't. And so I lose again. And then I'm like, all right, one more time. And then if I can't win one more time, then I'm like, yeah, no, I don't have this. Or I win. And then I'm like, okay, I won. Let's be done. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but it is something inherent in this, in this system, right? Because, again, there are other games that I might beat you in in our first play that don't always hook you back in for a second play right oh, yeah. away. I mean... There's some like, like Welcome To, we play that all the time. I don't know if I've ever, no, I just beat you last night in the zombie Welcome To. Oh yeah. I don't generally beat you in that game. Usually you win in Welcome To. Sure. But I still like it. Yeah, it's not always important But it's not one of those where it's like, I feel the need to then replay it again after losing. Like I still feel satisfied in the way I played it and the way that it turned out for me. Yeah, fair enough. Like in the way my strategy worked. But I think especially as a two player game, not that it's hard to set up. This is not a particularly difficult setup no, as far as a game goes. not at all. Um, the fact that it has that light setup and the fact that it encourages repeated plays, even if you're doing mostly the same, as you're talking about, it's mostly the same things. Uh -huh. right? It's the same order of what's wild. It's it, Unless you're switching which variant you're playing with, not much is going to fundamentally change. But games and how, you're, how you attack them are going to feel different yep. in, in terms of what you're going for and what your strategy looks like. Um, what to you distinguishes this gameplay-wise from the other Azuls? Is there a reason you'd like it more or like it less compared to those? Um, well, compared to the first one, it's like less mean. I can just play my own game and be very less concerned with what you're doing. There might be some moments where it's like, oh, he's going to try and finish this star or at the very end where I might want to like leave you with bits and bobs. But... As a whole, it's pretty singular focused, which I like more in a game. And then compared to the stained glass Azul, this one is just a little less fiddly in terms of how a turn works. Um, and I like that. Yeah, it certainly has a lot of advantages on, on that front, on that scale. Uh, I will say for me, I do like that it's less punishing. It feels like you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, what the game lets you do is between rounds, you can save four tiles. And the penalty for going fishing in the middle accelerates dramatically in Azul. I mean, when you can't place tiles, you those negative points can stack up in a hurry. In this one, there is very rarely a situation where you are going to be forced to take a bunch of negative points. Yeah. Usually negative points on a per round basis might be two or three or four from someone uh, going into the middle and taking that first player marker. It's not a major factor in the decision making. Obviously, you don't want negative points. You don't, you can, if you can avoid them, you, you should. Uh, we've certainly had enough close games where that might have been the difference in the game. Uh, but it's not like Azul where you need to very carefully make sure you have space open and you're, you're ready to go. This feels very loose and flexible on, on a couple of fronts. One, it doesn't punish you for taking extra stuff extra building materials, extra things you may not immediately need or have use for. It gives you the, the flexibility to save stuff between rounds, which is not the case in original Azul. And on top of all of that, I forgot my point. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say either. Are you sure? Yeah. I thought you were supposed to, to know me well enough to know what I was about to say. I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, no, oh... Because you can get bonus tiles mid-round, because you can complete areas and get those bonus oh, tiles. Oh, yeah, yeah, those bonus tiles. And complete the bonuses. That allows you to have some, some nice uh, flexibility in there, too. It allows you to mid-round pick up this wild. It allows you to pivot even after you've taken everything you're going to take for the round. What's available in the center can allow you to pivot on the fly. But it feels more open, more sandboxy, more I can build this the way I want to in the order I want to build it. I'm not as restricted in what I can take and what I can place. And yet, the game still feels 
difficult, especially on those last rounds. Yeah, yeah. You're still scrambling to complete as much as possible. Uh, you're going to agonize over what tiles come out in any given round. So it feels like it has the meatiness that comes with Azul, that thinkiness of trying to plan things out and figure out what goes where without feeling as punishing. Yes. And I think that for me is the biggest reason why I would want to play Azul Summer Pavilion over original Azul. Now here's the, is, is that the same for you? Yes. Okay. Would you think if someone had Azul in their collection and Azul Summer Pavilion, is that too much Azul or do they do things differently enough that you'd want to have both? I think they're different. I can see you wanting to play Azul with certain people that you're more competitive against. And it's like you want a lighter game that's still kind of just like puzzly and like not a huge amount of setup or anything. And maybe one that everyone already knows or is familiar with the layout of. But you can be a little bit meaner and be a little bit more like, ah, ha, ha. Whereas like Summer Pavilion, I think works really well for like us or if uh, like Lydia was over. Lydia is one of my friends. Uh, was over, say, and she was like, let's have a drink and play this game. And it's like, you can do it at your own pace. You can do whatever strategy you want. And you're not sort of like hindered by someone else who knows this format and is really good at it. Now, to be clear, there are moments where I can see you're gathering purple tiles. And because purple a purple star is worth more, I want to maybe slow you down and grab and prioritize grabbing purples. There's still moments where you can sure. be mean in this. They're just less so. They're less impactful because you don't actually know what's going to come out of that bag. Yeah. So you could grab all the purple tiles you want in one turn, but if that slows down your strategy and I'm still able to keep going with whatever you've left me with, then you've done nothing to hurt. In general, the thing with this game that I've found, and I don't know if you agree in terms of a strategy, is there are some cases where you want to be color specific, right? There's a certain color you want to prioritize and focus on, but in general... More building materials, the better. Yeah. The more you can get access to, the better. That's why I think it's less mean, because you can take all the purple tiles you want, but now you're focused on purple, and I can grab orange and yellow and green, and I'm building more options, and there's almost always somewhere you can use the tiles you've you've gotten. So it it just feels inherently more like you just have to be able to think on the fly versus mean. Well, and I'll, and I'll say this for base Azul. In base Azul, there can be a situation where you'd want to take fewer tiles and a situation where you want to take a lot of tiles. And it can vary over the course of the game. Usually in Summer Pavilion, save for maybe the very, very last round, you want to grab as much stuff as possible, generally speaking. It's usually, if between those two options, more will almost always be better. Except in that one game we played, where just one blue tile would have saved everything. One blue tile, ugh. Yeah, what were you, you were short on completing a star, I think? I, I needed to complete the star. I needed one blue tile to complete my star, and I couldn't get it. And I lost out on a bunch of points, and had I gotten those points, I would have won. But instead, I lost by one point. Yep. He's shrugging his shoulders at me, for those of you who can't see us right now, a.k.a. everyone. Rude. It's radio. It's radio. <laughs> Is that it radio? Does anyone listen to a podcast and say, I'm listening to the radio? If you have it playing through your car radio, maybe. Okay, probably not. No. God, get with the times, man. It's 2020. It is, unfortunately, 2020. <laughs> Yikes. Sierra <laughs> slapped us in the face. Yeah, not ideal. Not great in any form or fashion. Um, so, all right. So, ranking the Azuls. We have three Azuls, without giving your final score any of that yet. Just off of the gameplay and your enjoyment of the gameplay, what would you? How would you rank the three of them? Why can't I give my final score? Because we're not there yet. We got more stuff to do. But like, no. Does that like prohibit people from like? Is that all people listen to these rule re- like reviews for? Is it strictly for the final? Maybe. score? Maybe I'm just saying. There's a format. There's fast a- forward works, and now when you you always put it in the same place, they know exactly where to fast forward to to get the answer. Whereas if you just sprinkled it in wherever. They wouldn't do you want to just give forced. your score? No, I'm just letting you know that there are other options out there <laughs> for this layout. It's fine. I'm just a guest of all of the rules. <laughs> rank the three. Uh-huh. In terms of your enjoyment of them. Yep. How would you rank them? I would do three, one, two. So, Summer Pavilion, then Base Azul, then Sintra. OG Azul. 
Azul yes. Azul. Azul Azul, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in that order. Uh, cool. All right, that gives a good sense of things. I will, I, I, this is going to be the briefest section of this entire thing. We always have a section tab Wait, in here. you want to rank them. Oh, sorry. Uh, three, two, one. Summer Pavilion, Sintra, and then Azul. Uh, Sintra does a great job of being... It has a lot of crunchy, juicy decisions that that person that you kind of move forward and the positioning of them and when you reset and around and all of those sorts of things uh, make Sintra a really interesting experience and probably the deepest of the three Azuls, but this is probably the best. It kind of has the best of both. It still has deep enough decisions, but feels open and loose and flexible and, and just is a delight to play compared to uh, compared to the other. I mean, all three of them are fun. This is this I think would be my favorite of the bunch. So we only own the first one. Would you buy oh. the other two? Oh yeah, <laughs> it was like no, we own two. <laughs> no. We do not. This that this is one, one Jamie's is, game. Yeah, that is in fact Jamie Stegmeyer's copy of Azul Summer Pavilion. So uh, yeah, would I buy this? I don't know. I think it depends on your score at the end of this. That that determines this because uh, yeah, I anything that I think we'll play together, I am far more likely to buy. So I may enjoy a game at a level of a five or a six, but if I don't think I'm going to play it with you, there's usually less of a reason for me to personally own the game. We don't host another enough other game nights over here for me to worry about that. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where we get. All right. Theme. How thematic does this game feel to you? Like zero percent thematic. Zero point zero? Like no theme? Let me read you the story of this game and see if it changes your mind. At the turn of the 16th century, King Manuel I commissioned Portugal's greatest artisans to construct grandiose buildings. After completing the palaces of Evora and Sintra, the king sought to build a summer pavilion to honor the most famous members of the royal family. This construction was intended for the most talented artisans whose skills meet the splendor that the royal family deserves. Sadly, King Manuel I, for folks who can't see, Abby has actively like fallen asleep as I'm reading this. Sadly, King Manuel I died before construction ever began. In Azul Summer Pavilion, players returned to Portugal to accomplish the task that never began. As a master artisan, you must use the finest materials to create the Summer Pavilion while carefully avoiding wasting supplies. Only the best will rise to the challenge to honor the Portuguese royal family. Okay, so like when I think of a Summer Pavilion, mm -hmm. I think of like a gazebo. This is what? Like, <laughs> no, what? This is not that. This is just like a weird mosaic tile. I don't know. Yeah, zero theme. 0, 0.0 on theme. By the way, I agree. It's, it's, it's more abstracty. It's not meant to have a theme. It's yeah, not a problem. It I doesn't don't feel need like a theme. I don't think the game is missing something because there's not a theme attached to how I'm laying down my tiles. That's fair enough. Okay. Let's talk uh, about guild feedback. Guild had a, a couple of folks had thoughts on this. Uh, BJ from Board Game Gumbo says, I played Azul Summer Pavilion at BGG Con this past fall. It was super hot, always being played, and I waited out an entire game just to get a play in. It's my favorite between the two Azuls that I've played. I love the tower and the wild tiles and the patterns. It feels like a gamer's version of Base Azul. And what he says, what he's meaning when he's saying a gamer's version of Base Azul is it's more complicated or crunchy and. Honestly, having played them both back to back, I don't agree with that. I think Base Azul definitely has some crunchy decision points. The fact that you have that, that kind of layout and you have to determine, I need to grab red, so I make sure I fill out the red section of this to get the most points from connecting. Uh, the scoring system of Azul, Base Azul, is much more complicated than the scoring system in this game. In Base Azul, it's this connects and it's in this row and this column, so I get this many points because it's this and connected to that. This one is super simple. I place a tile. Is it next to stuff? Yes. Great. I get points for how many it's next to. If not, I get one point. It's pretty, pretty dirt simple. And the rest of the scoring is laid out on the board. I don't know. It doesn't, to me, this feels, if anything, slightly simpler than base Azul, not more difficult. I don't know. Just my, just my take. I mean, that's the whole premise of this show. That it's just my take? Yeah. And your take for this episode. Well, and Sean's take, but not on this review. Anyway. Uh, Rob Pettit says, My wife and I like Summer Pavilion the best of the bunch, with a close second being Sintra. We like the choices the game offers, and how you can feel very clever when you chain things together. After playing the last two versions of Azul, we find the first one too restricting, and we like the depth the latter two have. And, yeah, I think I think that's pretty well in line with what we've been saying so far. Yep. Awesome. Good, good, good review, Rob. 
Good review, Rob. Abby likes it. All right, we rate things here at the Dukes of Dice on a six-point scale, or Abby rates them on a slightly different version of the same scale, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, six being good, good, very good, one being bad, bad, very bad. It's going to be on the higher end of the scale, I think, for both of us. Abby, your version of this scale yep. is uh, ranges from heck yeah, at the very highest, that's, a, that's the six equivalent, and it goes all the way down to a... No. No, just a straight no. Though I feel like no is higher, actually, like, higher on this spectrum for you. Well, so the whole scale is based on if Alex were to say, do you want to play... X game, yeah. This insert game here. What's my response going to be? Yes. So, yeah, I think it goes no. Eh. eh. Sure. Sure. No, it goes no. Eh. eh. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yep. And uh, it, it, much like a typical six, a heck yeah is not an easy score to achieve in, in Abby's world. No, it's not easy at all. I think there's maybe two games, ha- Hanamakoji and Welcome To, that would that would fit the bill of a heck yeah for you. Oh, Wingspan. Wingspan and probably Mr. Kabachetz. Oh, you like that one that much? I good. Like okay. Kabachetz. All right. Good. So we'll see if another game is going to join uh, join that uh, join that esteemed group. Uh, so Abby. Go first. It's not joining the esteemed group. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, it gets a yeah, though. I liked it. I like it a lot. If Alex said, do you want to play it? I would probably say, yeah. Um, I mean, always. It's always within the mood. <laughs> you asked me if I wanted to play earlier, well, sure. and I said no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, overall, really enjoyed the game. Would recommend. Okay. Uh, I am in the same boat and, and on the same part of the scale. I, I give this one a five. A great game will rarely turn on a play of it. It, it doesn't take that long to play, no matter the player count. And we didn't, I, I didn't talk about player count variations. I've played this one at four, and I've played this one at two. And it felt perfectly satisfying at both of those counts. It's obviously shorter at four. Kind of some of the interesting things that come up is you can get these massive clumps of tiles that can come up and these opportunities that others may not spot or that can emerge uh, because you have so many more tiles in play. So there's some, some interesting combos that can come up at four. That being said... Uh, yeah, this is one I would absolutely recommend. If you enjoyed Base Azul, I think this one is less restricting, still has that same opportunity for cleverness, has enough variance in play uh, to, to keep it interesting, looks gorgeous on the table, and aside from a few other nitpicky kinds of things, really does Azul justice. Uh, it makes me curious to see if they have more in the pipeline, what else they could do with this model, but that same core drafting mechanic done in a way that feels really interesting, engaging, that planning ahead for using wild tiles is a lot of fun, uh, would strongly recommend. So yeah, this one gets a five from me. A great game will rarely turn out a play of it. And a yeah, also known as a five from Abby, comma, my fiance. Abby, thanks for joining me. I love you. I love you too. All right, Alex. Well, thanks to you and Abby for that review. We have a discussion topic to get into. Yeah, and and here's the thing, Sean. I don't know based on the pulse of the guild uh-huh. whether whether <laughs> whether this was something that just kind of fell flat, uh, or if it was something that got taken over by BJ from Board Game Gumbo suggesting picking out your favorite summer songs that kind of washed everything away. Uh, so. This definitely got some response, and we'll and we'll talk about that in a bit. But I don't know if it was just something that fascinated me a lot and you a lot, and maybe not the guild as much. I don't know. Time will tell. Um, but yeah, this is based on a concept we were talking about last episode that kind of interrupted the review. This fiddliness to depth ratio. And Sean, I think the first place to start is: should this be fiddliness to depth or depth to fiddliness? Um, it, well, it depends, but let me real quick, let me take a quick step back okay. and point out that you did start a whole separate thread about this in the guild before the, the Dukes on deck thread, but then you failed to link the thread in the Dukes on deck thread, which you normally will do whenever there's a separate thread. I had forgotten. I did that until <laughs> just now. So Whoops. there is, there, there is some additional guild commentary in this other thread, which I will, I will link in the, in the show. Uh, yeah. In the show notes. So um, no, I think, I think we're kind of tied into the fiddliness to, to depth ratio. 
Um, and I think it will be confusing to talk otherwise unless you have some profound reason why it should be the other way. So it's not my profound reasoning. And I actually disagree, disagreed with the reasoning, kind of. But Steve O'Rourke, in discussing this off the Guild, had mentioned that he thought that uh, just for our namesake, just in case, just in case this takes off, and people start referring to things as the Goldrum score. They won't, but go on. They won't, but in case they do. Uh, that's the suggested name, by the way. Uh, the Goldrum score, Goldsmith and Ramirez combined. Uh, I, I don't think that name's taking off. It's fine. Uh, but in case they did, he said, you want to be associated with something positive. Hey, that game's really high in the Goldrums. There's right. a really high gold. So he, he was looking out for us and our reputation. And so for that reasoning, he thought it made more sense to be a depth to fiddliness discussion rather than a fiddliness to depth. Hmm. Uh, that something high is good, low is bad. Now, my counter to that is there are plenty of sports stats where that's not always true. For instance, ERA in baseball, you want a low ERA if you're a pitcher, not a high ERA. So there are plenty of stats that, that go that way. But for the most part, he's not, he's not wrong. So I don't know what, what say you on that, Sean. I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, I always hate in a game where you, where you want to roll low right? Because it does seem counterintuitive. And the way that this proportion works also is that, and I think this is why I like it with fiddliness first, because if a game has a one-to-one -one fiddliness to depth ratio, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? No, in fact, in fact, that's kind of the line where it's, it's usually a decent thing. Exactly. So, so in, in my mind, if, if the fiddliness to depth ratio is less than less than one, then that's great, right? Um, and if it's higher than one, if it's one to five, um, then that's when things start to get really bad. And if it's if it's like two, you're like, uh, let's be careful. But if it's five, it's like, oh my, oh man, avoid that game at all costs. And so, so what I was doing, I think what we discussed uh, in our review of what were we reviewing, uh, Paladins of the West Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where we pretty much exhausted the topic in some some respect, uh, but basically, if you if you have like a five point scale for fiddliness, uh, you know five being super fiddly, and then you have a five point scale for depth, depth being you know very deep game, not necessarily complex, but with you know significant decisions to make, uh, then that ratio of of fiddliness to depth, so a game could be. So actually what I did, and oh, it's on the other computer. Shoot. Dang it. Okay. What I did was I actually took, uh, I assigned scores for the top 20 BGG games. Okay. Interesting. And what I, what I found was, at least in my estimation, they were all at one or lower, right? Because if at one, you know, maybe it's a, it has a fiddliness of five, but a depth of five. Okay. But it's interesting too, because it doesn't necessarily give you any indication of what the fiddliness is or the depth is only the relation to one another because it, it may be that alex you will say if any game ever has a fiddliness of four or five regardless of the gold room score i'm probably not going to want to play it that's true for the most part yeah right it, it's not 100 percent true and, and but also keep in mind much like with depth where sometimes we'll disagree or and so we, we used to dramatically disagree on this how heavy a game was, whether a right. game was light, medium, medium, or medium heavy, or whatever flavor on that scale it is. Much like that, that applies. There are some people who, who a game's fiddliness is a subjective score. A game's depth is to a degree a, a, a subjective score. Sure. So there's, there's some subjectivity to this scale. What it's trying to get at though is, is, is a game worth it? Is this game worth it to break out, to play, to invest the time into? does this game feel worth it at the end of the day? I think that's really what the Goldrum score ties into. It also ties into a feeling of, of elegance. Now, Sean, before we get too much deeper into this, I do want to make sure we're setting terms properly. And I know most listeners are, are, are heavier board gamers. Um, based on our own surveys that we've done the show, most are, are Sean listeners. But regardless, fiddliness, when we're talking about fiddliness, we're talking about several things. Setup time, breakdown time, and uh, time during and between turns. How many moving parts there are, turns and rounds, I should say. How many moving parts there are to a game, um, how difficult it is to actually get to the, to, to the play. That's what we're talking about with fiddliness. Does that definition fit for you, Sean? Yeah, I think so. And I think if you want to sum it up is, 
how much does this feel like work? Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? How much does it feel like you're, you're, there's a mon certain monotony to it? Yeah. Although I think that one's, it can be a little bit deceptive because for the right space game, if you're really into that theme, just setting up that kind of a game cannot feel like work in some ways. So yeah, I, I get uh, there's some piece of that that's built into the score. And I think some of it is also just though sheer amount of time on some of these steps. How long does a typical turn take? How long does it right. take to set up between rounds? How long does it take to set up and break down? So yeah, I think that question is not a bad one to ask as part of this, but I don't know if it gives a complete picture in all cases, mainly because there's some folks who setting up and, and, and organizing a game doesn't feel like work to them. To me, it does. I'm not sure. good at organizing anything, but um, yeah, it, it, it can feel like it can feel like work or not feel like work. But there's a certain amount of that's a, that's a barrier there that, that will be a barrier. So so let me let me just highlight it with a, with a game, for example, Twilight Imperium. Twilight Imperium, I would put as a very fiddly game, very high on the fiddly score and because there's so much of the game. It's like, OK, what phase are we in? All right. We're at the start of the turn. So it is the strategy phase. We have to go around in order. And you're constantly like making sure everybody's on the same page. Whose turn is it now? Okay, it's your turn. Um, monitoring the resource pools and the tactical pool. It, there, there's a lot of work to it and a lot of, for some people, keeping other people kind of on track. And so now that doesn't mean, so for example, it doesn't mean that I dislike the game. In fact, I like it quite a bit because I find that the depth is relative to the, to the fiddliness. So, so yeah, the, I, like, I like organizing games. I like setting them up to a certain extent, and, but, but it's still, it, it can still feel a little bit like work. And again, that's, that's just a shorthand. I think your more exhaustive description is better. Sure. But yeah, I, there can be shorthand and in-depth, but I think we have a good understanding of what we're talking let me, about. Let me put it this way. A yeah. game that is high on the fiddliness to depth ratio is going to feel like work. Yes, that is true. That is 100% true. There's no yeah. doubt about that. So yeah, no, and, and it, mm, that's an interesting way of thinking about it too. I've thought about it as, as, is this game worth it? But it's also a, does this game feel like work? Right. So yeah, I think that's actually an interesting way to think about it. Hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, depth, I don't think we need to get too much into other than it, it tends to be how how crunchy or interesting are the decisions? How uh, how how interesting is the game? How uh, how much does it absorb you? How much do you get into it? So I think that's we we've talked about depth to death on this show. That's that's when I'm less yeah less at issue but, for me. But it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily correlate to complexity or heaviness. It it right. certainly can, and it's certainly more likely. But it doesn't necessarily have to. There are probably some relatively lighter, shorter games that we might still say have a significant amount of depth. I, I mean, I, so chess would be a great example. And, and folks cited on the guild, we'll get to it as we talk through this, abstracts. Abstracts tend to be games that are very, very solid on the, on the Goldrum scale um, right. on the, or, or have a good Goldrum score. I don't know. It feels awkward for me even saying that. I, I, I this, this name is not, this name is not going to work, Sean. I don't know. Uh, it, it's low on this score because it, it, it's super easy to set up. Usually, there's usually not a ton of between round work. There's not a ton of of breakdown time, anything like that. Something like chess is a good example. Uh, but the depth of that game is is pretty intense, uh, and it's not. And chess is not a complex game necessarily. There are complex strategies, uh, but the gameplay itself and the mechanics of it aren't necessarily complex. But it, yeah, it gets to your point. There's a difference between depth and complexity. I think chess is as good example as any of that. Right. So, so I think anytime you have a scale like this or a score like this, having some examples of things that are on the high end and the low end of the scale can give you a sense of, of what a game will feel like and, and what kind of fits the profile of this. And I also think something in the middle, something that's, that's right on that, that line works really well. So for me, a game that is very high on this score, gets a very high score for this, is something like, and man, I, I, as I was thinking about it, I literally forgot the game. Sean, it's the game that has a spinning Jenny variant. Oh, Arkwright? Arkwright. Oh God, did that feel mm. like work. That game mm. feels incredibly like work. It is also very deep, 
So I don't know if it's possible that the fiddliness score goes higher than a five in some cases because this felt like a, a deep game, but it felt like the fiddliness overwhelmed it. Maybe this is a better example of something, Sean, where there's a certain fiddliness score that you, may not, you just may not want to tolerate. And that may be it. I think anything that's truly a five might be something I don't tolerate well. So that may not have a very high score, but it definitely feels like it has a high barrier to entry. I think a better example of this, Sean, and maybe it's part of the reason we don't like this game so much, infamously don't like this game so much, is Machi Koro. Uh -huh. If I'm thinking about the setup and uh, breakdown and, and kind of these different stacks of cards and setting out the biros and all of that, I think part of what made that game so unsatisfying was you go through all of that effort, all of that work, and it doesn't feel like there's enough game. There, it doesn't feel like there's enough depth there. Uh, I will also bring up some games will have a different gold room score depending on player count. Right. So first class is an example of that for me where I broke it out for Abby and taught it and we played it. And the setup time for that is beefy. You have to insert the different modules. You have to shuffle. You have to lay out the different by rows. You have to lay out the trains. There's some between round scoring and maneuvering you have to do. And at two players, it just doesn't last long enough to feel super worth it unless you're going to play it twice. Sure. And so at that count, its gold room score is not very good. But if you play it at, say, four players, it feels worth it. The game feels meaty enough. You're, you're carefully watching the other decisions to see what card rows are going to be available. Uh, so you're not making any more decisions, but it somehow feels more worth it to me at that kind of a count. So that's an example of something that, that scores poorly for me. On, on the gold room score. What are some examples for you, Sean? Well, hold, hold on. Let's, let's, let's score those. Let's, yeah, score, okay. sure. let's score Machi Koro. Machi Koro. Yeah, so probably a depth of, of, a, of a one, one and a half at most. If, are we allowed to do fractions with this scale? I think we are. <laughs> sure. I'll hold on. Thanks, thanks. I'll allow it. Okay. Uh, we'll call it a one or a one and a half. And I think the, the fiddliness of it was probably a two and a half to a three remembering that game, and it's been a long time since I played that game. Okay. It might have been just a straight two. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, okay, so you're saying 1.5 in terms of fiddling. Wait, hold on. What's your fiddliness score? Fiddliness score is a is a two and a half, I think, is where I'm settling on in my okay. mind. Okay, and so the depth is a what? One and a half? Yeah, two and a half to one and a half. Wait, the depth... I'm sorry. The de I can't. The de I, I can't do the ranges. Just the give depth. Me a score. Is, the depth is a one and a half. Sure. And the fiddliness is what? It's a two and a half. Okay. Um, so that gives it a score of one point six six. Yep. Okay. Not outrageous, but not great either. Yeah, and and I would probably say. I don't think you're far off. I mean. So the weight rating, which is kind of a, a good thing that, that fits, sort of fits the depth of this, kind of, kind of, sort of can, can stand in. It's a 1.54 on BGG. So I, I feel pretty good about the one and a half for that side of it. Okay. Okay. And then what was the other game? The other game. Well, I mentioned, I mentioned Dark Right. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a one. I mentioned uh, first class with two players. Okay, so first class, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right that the play count can definitely affect that. Um, I've only played it at three and four. Hmm, okay. Um, so I can, yeah, I guess I could see that. So first class has a, has a depth score or a complexity score, if you look at BGG, of a 2.78, so you could call it a two and a half or a three. Mm -hmm. And I think the fiddliness of setup in that game is at least a three and a half, maybe a four. Oh my uh, God, a four? A four? If, hold on. Okay. If Arkwright is a five fiddliness. This is why that, that score doesn't feel fitting to me. Like, it feels like Arkwright is so much further out than that. So, yeah, maybe it's not a good and apt comparison. I don't know. Play, here's the thing is, is too, Sean. Play length can have an impact on depth, sure. too. So maybe it's not even depth we're talking about. I don't know. It's the amount, it's the amount of value you... It's kind of a value ratio in a weird way. Mm. Oh, maybe right? you're it's, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like fiddliness to value in a sense. No, I, oh, wow. No, you're right. And it's a little late in the conversation for us to both acknowledge. No, it's I not late in the right. conversation at all, Sean. We're just getting started. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, I'm saying I think you're right. I think you're yeah. right. I think, it is, I think it is fiddliness to value. Yeah. Or, is, or wait, or is that really what we're measuring? 
is the friendliness to death ratio the actual value? Is that, uh, how, you, is that how you get to the value? Now I don't no, know. No, because I think value, if you were to take, remove, remove the obstacles in a game's way. I'll, I'll give an example. Of, okay, here's, a, here's an example that I was going to bring up. Sentinels of the Multiverse. Mm -hmm. Sentinels of the Multiverse in person is a very, in my, in my opinion, an incredibly fiddly experience. Yes. There's a lot of different damage markers you have to keep track of, resistances. Um, the boss is doing this much damage, you're doing that much damage, everyone has different items. Oh, well, my item can help you. And there's just a lot of different moving parts. If you strip all of that away, if you strip all of the fiddliness of that away, the game is a series of interesting decisions about what gear to have, when to draw cards, when to attack, how to attack, which thing to attack. That is the value of the game. The value of the game being its length of entertainment to a degree, and also do the decisions that you're making feel worth it or add up to a sum that, that feels like it's of value. That's what I'm saying that there's, because I know this from having played on the app, when you strip away having to do all of the bookkeeping, that game itself feels worth it. It shines. I love that game in app form. Well, you stripped away the fiddliness. Right. The app strips away the fiddliness. It does. I think, I think the value is, is what comes out of the ratio <laughs> of fiddliness to death. No. I agree with you at first, but I, I'm, I'm going back. I think, I think that's what we're defining here is the value, the subjective value to you as a gamer. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but yeah, part of it feels, bro like Arkwright feels like it kind of breaks the scale to me because that game feels like a ton of work. But if I look at it under the scale that we've created, even if I give it max scores in both, because it's a really complex, difficult game. And at the same time, it's an incredibly fiddly game. There are games that fit that bill that would have a five in both categories for me. I think, for instance, well, maybe not. See, that's the thing, is I think, I think it's, it's not enough to simply say, here's, here's the ratio. Or, or rather, here's, here's, the, here's what it reduces to. Here's the score. I think yeah. the score is bad. I think we need to not... Well, I think you almost need a score for a relative... You also need to show the ratio, right? Like, if I'm like, Alex, here is a, a five, five to five, five colon five, which is, which is one, right? Yep. That's, a, yep. that's a one. A one, we're saying, are, are generally good. So, Alex, you should like this game because it's a one. Well, hold on. It's still got five fiddliness. I'm not down for a five fiddliness. Right. No matter what the deck is, no matter how interesting the decisions are, you're never going to enjoy our play, which is fantastic. And by the way, I would give our play five and five. It is super fiddly. Actually, no, you know, I'd probably give it four. I'm going to give it a four. Once you play some of the heavy war games, Alex, it oh, just boy. It throws everything. But, but I think that's the part of the problem, too, is at the high end of this scale, there is a lot of variance. There's a lot of variance between, say, an Alchemist, which felt very fiddly at the time when we were playing it, and I think to you would seem like a cakewalk compared to some of the games that you've taken on. And for me, that's one of the highest games on the scale that I think I've played. Huh. In terms of fiddliness? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the managing of the, the different um, recipe charts and things like that. I don't know. It feels like we're spinning in circles, and I'm realizing there's major problems with this whole concept. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Excellent. So do you remember playing um, The Trail at House on the Hill? I have played that. I don't think I ever played that with you. No, I don't think we've ever played together. Th no. That, to me, is a super fiddly game. Uh, you're, you're a... It's cooperative at first. You're exploring this mansion on the top of the hill, um, and you're laying out tiles, and then every time you lay out a tile, you have to resolve certain things. Uh, monsters come out, or there's encounter cards, and there's haunts that happen, I don't know. And right. then at a certain point, you trigger, you trigger the betrayal, where one player is now the big bad, and it's going to be a random set of encounters that determines which of these, like, 40 different uh, big bads they are. And I just find it super fiddly. Like, I would give this, uh, like, a three fiddly to one. That yep, low. Maybe okay. one and a half. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is in thinking about this more, theme kind of... That's why depth feels like it's a bad, it's a bad term. Because I think your scores are not wrong. Or, or certainly are not far off. But it feels like that value side of it is higher for me because you get into the theme. You get into the theme of this person's chasing me, or you get into the theme of you're in this mansion and these haunts are happening. And 
the more you're into a theme, the less it can feel like work to a degree. So on its face, on its on the surface, you're dead right. That's a game that there isn't a ton to. I think part part of why I didn't enjoy Undaunted Normandy was I was hoping for a bit more on the on the depth side of things. Right? Mm-hmm. That was you were, we were talking about the combat, especially in that game, not being quite satisfying enough. So, but I will tell you, some of that is also I'm not a big war game person most of the time. It's not a theme that draws me in, and so there are games that objectively, if you were just looking at it as a fiddliness and a depth, we could give it the same score, but that same score would mean something very different. And I think that depth side needs to account some way for enjoyment on a thematic level. Enjoyment on a, on, yeah, how much you enjoy the game, I guess. But I don't know. That seems weird because you're dividing by something that you're ultimately getting. It doesn't work. None of it works, Sean. No, I think, but I think you're right to a certain extent. I mean, because it is, it is a, we were clear to say it's not just the weight of the game. It's not just the complexity of the game. It is It is still how interesting the level of decision-making in the game, which I think can be influenced by theme. Sure. I, I, where if, you're, if, if the theme of the game and the narrative of the game is increasing how you feel about the decision-making, then absolutely. Let me go back a step. <laughs> this is terrible. This is, it's fine. This is the worst. This is, this is the best. This is no, the worst discussion we've this ever is had. great. This is. <laughs> this feels like we're in a universe. We're university professors debating a very intense, in-depth. It's good. It's very helpful. We're coming. We're coming to a unified theory here, Sean. It's okay. going to happen. I, I. So I'm coming. I'm going to circle back to a concept, and it's a word I said at the very beginning of the discussion. <laughs> that is now hitting me. I think honestly, what this thing is creating or or assessing is elegance. Elegance is more what this scale or this score can assess. Okay, as the product of the ratio. Correct. Okay. Because Betrayal at House on the Hill might get that score, and I might enjoy it more than you do, even if we'll give it the same scores on fiddliness and depth, but I think we would, where we would both probably agree is that it, it definitely doesn't feel like an elegant game. It, it can feel clunky in its implementation to an extent. Mm, I wouldn't call Arkwright elegant. Sure. I, I mean, obviously you wouldn't, uh, but I don't know that I would either. Elegant like, relative to its its complexity, though. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know. So, like, so I mean, for instance, this is why Motainai. Motainai is the perfect example for this of this for me. Motainai is I. I think bar none, the most elegant design, elegantly designed game I've ever played. Because you have so many things that are determined in so few steps. The setup uh-huh. of the floor also determines first player. The, it's a deck of cards, it's two mats in front of you, and maybe a player reference card. It takes no time to set up. There's nothing you need to seed, there's nothing you need to do fancy with the deck. It takes no time to set up. That game is incredibly deep, though, because of the interactions of the cards. It has a lot of complexity. It just doesn't have a lot of fiddliness. There's some fiddliness in the movement of cards, right? And in, and in trying to remember to do different steps of the in the morning effect, in the evening effect. That's where some clunkiness comes into play. But I think as a whole, if you look at the depth you get in that game versus the fiddliness built into that game, I'd say it's a two and a half, two to two to two and a half on the on the fiddliness side and a four on the depth side for my money. Hmm. And that, to me, indicates a really elegant game. I, so I don't think that I don't think that this stupid thing measures elegance. Oh no! I think we could say that certain games below a certain threshold could be considered elegant. So if sure. you're at a point five or less, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're elegant. Oh, I don't know. It's a mess. It's all a mess. <laughs> Maybe the guild can help get us back on track, Sean. Robo Rally, Alex. Robo Rally, I would, I would say, is um, high fiddliness with low depth. No, that's yeah. not true. Well, I don't know. I would, I would put the fiddliness of Robo Rally at like a four or five. Okay. And the depth at like a two, maybe a three. You think the fiddliness of Robo Rally is, is on par with Arkwright? Yes. And, and let me tell you why. Oh, boy. Be- because of. There's more rote repetitive 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 repetitive, repetitive, repetitive tasks. 
repetitive tasks. There you go. Sure. It's been a long week now. It's, there, there's more repetition in the game that just seems very rote, and you're just going through the motions. There's much less going through the motions about writing. But there's other stuff that definitely makes it fiddly, too. I would say fiddliness-wise, yeah, they're, they're both on the same scale, but for different reasons. Okay. Interesting. Well, we've come to no conclusions. Perfect. Let's go to the guild. Jason Brown says, all through the GR ratio debate, one game kept coming to mind, Fortune and Glory, the cliffhanger game. I'd rate this at 5 to 1. The high fiddliness comes from the countless little rules that complicate every choice in action and are spread randomly throughout a rambling rulebook. The low depth score is because you really just move around, do what the cards say, and roll dice to resolve choices. That said, I love this game. Despite the headaches from the rules and frustration from dice rolling, roll and move, really, this is the finest Ameritrash game ever made. It's essentially Indiana Jones in a box right down to punching Nazis. It epitomizes the Ameritrash motto of roll, move, and kick some ass. Now, Sean, mm-hmm. I, I will say I have a game that fits the bill that fits this exact category for me, uh, which is Tales of Arabian Nights. Mm. Tales yeah. of Arabian Nights absolutely is incredibly high on the fiddliness side and incredibly low on the depth side. And it's still a really enjoyable, engaging experience. So I don't know. I would argue Fog of Love, a game I also love, fits the bill in terms of being mm. relative to its weight, relative to its weight fiddlier than it is deep. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so I'll say a lot of, I think a lot of Ameritrash adventure games like this could potentially fall in this category. Um, I would say Eldritch Horror is probably high mm. fiddly, low depth. Um, Talisman and, and 40k version Relic. Uh, you Remember how much you hated Relic? I don't even remember Relic. We played it at AI early on, there, before the podcast even. Oh boy. It's, it's, it's three rings. Like it's basically a roll and move. While you're talking, while you keep talking and I'll, okay. I'll look this game it's, up. And, and so both Talisman and Relic are basically roll, rolls and move, rolls and move, roll and moves, mm-hmm. um, where you're rolling the dice, going around the outside edge of the board, doing certain encounters. Eventually you can go to the second level, uh, and then eventually go into the middle where there's the final showdown. And I remember you, this. I, kind of liked it at first because I played Talisman back in the day. But I, I mean, I, it's not a, not a thing I would really enjoy now. And I, and I feel like, I feel like I was more, the fiddliness to depth was something I was more tolerable of as I was going. Like even Axis and Allies, I don't know that I really want to play that now. Sean, where would you put Blood Bowl? Um, because it has a lot of little kind of incy wincy little rules. Sure. I think that point that he made is also pretty valid. There's decent depth in the line play, I guess, but a lot of times it just comes down to kind of chuck and dice. Mm, I, oh, I disagree with that. I mean, it came down to that in our game. Well, yeah, but there's a lot of... There is, there's more strategy than meets the eye, I will Yeah, agree. there's a ton of strategy in Blood Bowl. I mean, I'd, I'd probably... Call, it's, it's a one. It's like a three to, three to three or something like that. Okay, that's not like, bad. It's, it's close to a one. Uh, cool. Jimmy DM90 gave some examples of good Goldrum and bad Goldrum. So he referenced most abstracts. I 100% agree. I think uh, those tend to be the quintessential uh, low Goldrum score games. They, they tend to have easy setup times. They tend to have low maintenance. There's usually not rounds where you're doing a lot of setup or accounting or different things. Uh, but the depth can usually be pretty off the charts with those games. So I, I 100% agree with that. Uh, Food Chain Magnate? Ugh. I, I feel like I can't even speak well to this anymore. Well, I've, I've, but I think it I think it goes back to if we're calling that a four or five fiddly, it just speaks again to if it's a four or five fiddly, Alex avoid it. Yeah. Regar- regardless of what the ultimate ratio is. Could be. Although there are games in that category that I've I've found myself pleasantly surprised by. Pax Transhumanity certainly fits that bill of it would certainly be a, a four or five fiddly easy. And I found myself enjoying it partially based on theme, partly based on how it just melted my brain. Uh, that, that is, uh, Indonesia, I think, fits. Yeah, it, it's less fiddly than some of the other ones, at least to how it felt to me, mm-hmm. but still had a, a strong amount of depth. So um, could be. You could be right. Grand Austria Hotel. It's been so long since I played that game. I liked that game a lot at the time. 
Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd call this a good gold room. I'd say it's close to that one ratio. Yeah, I I would too. I don't know. Jimmy, feel free to throw your, your counter-argument back in the guild. Uh, and then you mentioned Circle of the Wagons, which I have not played. Nor have I. Okay. Bad Goldrum, Quadropolis, 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah, the, the setup and, and the clearing up and all of that fun stuff uh, compared to the depth of the game, definitely, yeah, definitely a bad score. Steampunk Rally, I haven't played that one. So I don't know. Uh, and then Jenga. Jenga is all about fiddliness, kind of. Kind of, kind of, kind yeah, of. Uh, there aren't yeah. a lot of corner case rules with Jenga. The setup can be a little bit annoying with the kind of making sure you, you lay things out. Although most of the ways, most of the times it's packed, it kind of is packed in the box as is. So it's already good to go. And although you're fiddling with the pieces, that's the game. It's, the, it's, it's dexterity, I guess. But I don't think that means it gets a five on the scale or anywhere close. So I don't know if I'd agree yeah. with that one. I might say Jenga is like a two to one. It might get like a two on the, squ- on the scale. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, probably. Okay. King Splendor says, three games in my collection that I think rate well on the Gold Room scale are Han Makoji, Patchwork, and Palm Island. All three of these have very simple rule sets, yet pack a punch of choices every turn. I think you, you and I would both absolutely agree with Han Makoji and Patchwork. I, I don't know anything about Palm Island. I haven't played it. I do know it involves a, a deck of cards that sits, a small deck of cards that sits in your hand. And you play the entire game from your palm. That's all I know about it. All right. Yep. But I would certainly the first two, 100% agree. Yeah, I think they would, would both score pretty well on the, on the scale. Patchwork may be a little bit lower just because of some of the initial setup and laying out all the pieces. Uh, but generally speaking, those are, and those are two games I would consider fairly elegant in how they're set up, especially Hana Makoji, uh, where you have the entire deck gets used, and that's sort of your timer for the round. So, yeah, the entire deck gets used. No cards in deck, no cards in hand. Everything on the table. Uh, All right. Rob Pettit says, as far as fiddliness to depth, I find that most of the Tiny Epic games have a high fiddliness to depth ratio. I think the best of the bunch is Galaxies, and that's in part because it probably has the most streamlined rules. In general, I think card games and abstract strategy games have good ratios. I think Arboretum is something that has a great ratio. There's a lot packed into just a deck of cards. Other examples of poor ratios are X-Wing Miniatures Game. I think any, any kind of miniatures game probably scores pretty, pretty poorly on this score. Oh, I don't, Not, I don't agree with that. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, Terror in Meeple City, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, also known as uh, Rampage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fireball Island, bumping the table, but still great fun. I, Fireball Island is a is a nightmare on this score. It, it definitely takes a lot to set up and get all the marbles in place and get the different things, but it's all kind of part of it, kind of part of setting the mood and the presentation. And uh, so I don't think it completely hurts the game, though I do know there are opportunities where I might have wanted to pull out a game of that length or that complexity, but the setup would have me feel a little less inclined. Certainly possible. Examples of good ratios, Onitama, Hive, Century Spice Row, the Azul games. Agree with all those. I agree with all those. And in some some cases, I think, Sean, you would put those closer to one-to-one, though, as opposed to below one. Uh, Onitama, I would put below one. I, yep. I would put below one. Century Spice Road, probably one. Yeah. Azul, probably one. Depends on the Azul. Yeah. I think, I think the second Azul, I might put a little below one, not much. But you're, I think you're probably correct that most Azuls are right about at that one-to-one, which is fine. It's a fine place to be. Yeah. Uh, He also continued to say, this is a very fascinating topic. After listening to you guys and thinking about it, I think this has a big impact on what games my wife and I like. The depth and fun factor has to be there to make the fiddliness worthwhile. For me, I love Scythe and Five Tribes and feel that even though there is some fiddliness to these games, it is far outweighed by the amount of depth they provide and fun I have when playing them. The rules, while quite a lot, are very easy to pick up on and make the game smooth after learning. Maybe the best way to say this is how often do you have to check the rulebook while playing and do you have to continually recheck the rulebook after multiple plays to find obscure rules and clarifications on different situations? If you are constantly having to recheck the rulebook every time you play, wouldn't that take away from the experience of playing? This is why I think Scythe and Five Tribes excel. While there are a lot of rules, once you learn how to play these games, you really have to look into the rulebook for clarifications. I would agree with that. I would say consistency of rules can also have an effect on that too. If a sure. game behaves in cases like you would expect it to thematically or based on other rules within the game, I think that can help reduce a game's fiddliness or kind of mental load that it might uh, require to actually get to the fun of a game. So Yeah, and, and so 
in my mind, the, the game that I think <laughs> can feel like work, but not being tired of them, uh, just doing portions of the game, would be Castles of Burgundy. Mm. I, love, I love Castles of Burgundy. But when I'm playing the actual, the actual game, not online or, or whatever, uh, or the app, I dread the end of rounds. I dread it. Like I, like I, literally am like, oh, it's coming. It's 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 coming. It's gonna happen because five times during the game, you have to wipe the depots, uh, replace them with specific tiles from specific sets. You then have to lay out the uh, the new. Uh, trade goods and a lot of the felts have really fiddly between round breakdown and setup. Right, a lot of games you do most of the setup at the beginning, most of the breakdown at the end. Felds has a ton of it from you know from round to round. Yep, but it's I'd okay. Agree with you. But it's okay because right? it's a really it's a really good game. Um, and even you know he mentioned five tribes, super fiddly game, but boy, is it is it a super deep game. So. I think I think being able to accept that a game may not score very well on this, but you still may love it, is is part of what goes into this. And and maybe that doesn't doesn't necessarily have the score be of too much value. I just think it's it's an interesting lens to view things through. Nothing we've discussed here today, Alex Matter. That's basically <laughs> what you're getting at. I think that could make that announcement at the end of every episode, and it would it would be about right. Uh well, Sean, we went around in circles. Any conclusions you reached from from this wonderful discussion? Um, <laughs> none, none whatsoever, Alex. <laughs> other that, other than that, uh, I, I I live in the in the dungeon of the dungeon now, Alex. I am mm. here like ten hours a day. Yeah, it's not 12, great. Twelve today. How many spiders are there? You have a lot of spider oh, coworkers. No, you know what? Since I've, I'm down here all the time, I see a lot fewer of them. I think I've, I think I've driven them up into the house. That's good. I mean, there's that one behind you right now. No, that's that's my buddy. <laughs> that's Karen. He didn't. To, for the record, for folks who who can't see the webcams currently, he did not fall for it. I did so, not. Nice. Yeah, I did try. Well, no, it wasn't. I, I don't think it was that good of a try, actually. So. Yeah, I know. I was being polite. No, thanks. Thanks. Anyway, thanks to everyone who participated on the guild on this discussion topic. Uh, sorry for wasting all of your time with that, with that discussion. <laughs> uh, before we wrap things up, we wait, want to talk about me, the... What? Wait, let me say this. Let me say oh, this. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, so if nothing else, if you would like the Dukes of Dice to return to the regular, the regular format that we normally do, just continue practicing social distancing and following all of the federal directives <laughs> so that we could end this crisis and get back to normal. This is, this is, this is the most important thing going on right now. Is yep. making sure that that uh, fewer people are dying, and also we can get back to playing new games in person. Exactly. Yes. Not with each other. Not in person with each other. Well, no, probably not. Although I, I will tell you, very briefly, there was a consideration for possibly driving out to Santa Fe uh, to just hang there for a week because I'm both of us are working full remote anyway. But then I was like, well, I also don't want to kill my parents. Yeah, so don't kill your maybe, parents. Maybe, maybe, maybe we won't do that. So anyway. I almost, for a brief moment, there was a chance of, uh, that we would drive 15 hours out to New Mexico to go hang out for a week. But I also, I wouldn't have been able to see you anyway. It didn't happen. I'm just saying. It was a thought. Anyway. Uh, yeah. All right. Before we wrap things up, let's talk about the best of the rest. Honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. Wait, I have another thought on this discussion topic, Sean. Are you, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. Oh. Uh, I think if a game is low on the scale, in other words, it, it has a below one ratio, there's a very good chance you like it. But I think if it's above a one, it doesn't necessarily mean that you hate it. Sure. Well, well put, Alex. That's my conclusion. All right. Now for the third time. And I, now to the best of the rest. The best of the rest. Uh, other names for this episode that were suggested, the rest of the top six that we did not pick. First up, D. Shannon with... Sweet Summer Brainchild. Summer for Azul, Brainchild referring to the Goldrum score, the brainchild of Goldsmith and Ramirez, though I don't know if I want to take credit for this anymore. And Sweet Summer Child referring to Abby, poor soul, being plunged into the deep end of board game reviewing. She does great at it. I'm not too worried. To be clear, uh, I haven't recorded that segment as of the time we're recording this segment, but I know it's going to go great, or has gone great, in the time of you listening to it. Yes. Time. So, so... My sweet summer child, that's what old Nan says to Bran 
in Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And it's interesting because it's Sweet Summer Brainchild, and Brain sounds a little bit like Bran. I don't think that was intended. No, it definitely wasn't intended, <laughs> if I had to guess. Anyway. Uh, the, uh, yeah. The name father, Steve Ward, suggested there is no Sean, only a Zool, which is a Ghostbusters reference. There is no Dana, only Zool, who is one of the Sumerian gods that they summon. Uh, spoiler alert, it turns out to be the Safe Puff Marshmallow Man. Um, but yeah, I, and there was some question of, has this been suggested before? And I feel like some, I feel like it had back when the three of us reviewed uh, the second visual about a year ago. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, good suggestion, Steve. Yep. Joshi and Gurr suggested Grah! which uh, basically on as it was typed out was G R R and then a whole bunch of A's with the parentheses screamed with feeling. Which yeah. I didn't feel like doing because I've already inconvenienced Abby enough. It's some uh, some stage direction. That's helpful. If people it is want to add stage direction to their game suggestions, that's totally welcome. It's true. Uh, sometimes I need it. So uh, the Gur part of it, or the Goldsmith Ramirez ratio, uh, which not catching on at all, but it's fine. Uh, and then lots of A's for Alex, Abby, and Azul. And the title also reflects the feeling of going stir crazy in this quarantine. Yeah, I get that too. Boy, howdy. Boy, howdy. Nick Hayes suggested Summer Lovin', uh, of course, because Summer Pavilion's as well. Uh, what's the love? I mean, Lovin'? It's, it's, bec- it's because Abby and I. Oh, oh yeah. that's adorable. And the thought that if, if she were on during this part, we could sing a duet of that at this point. But probably not. Oh. Yeah. Well, the song's problematic, but anyway. <laughs> I'm not going down that road. Uh... Oh, I just realized we have to eliminate one name. So sorry, BJ, your your name suggestion of goals in the summertime just missed out on the top six because we had six names down here and we only have room for five. So oh. our final name suggestion comes from King Splendor uh, with Manuel Override. Manuel for King Manuel, the first mentioned in Azul, and Manual Override for the Goldrum scale aiming to tweak the complexity rating system on BGG. I don't know if we have quite that ambition, especially after that discussion. No, not at all. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. I may I may just delete the wave files, Alex. For this whole episode? I I might. Well we'll see. No, it's fine. We've if had If there was worse. a time for a technical error to happen, it would be It would now. be now. <laughs> okay. I don't want to wish that because I've done yeah. a re recording with you, or we've also done the piece together like after the fact Sean recording. Uh-huh. And uh not fun. So yeah, not nope. not something I want to wish for. Thank nope. you very much. Nope, nope. Yeah, it's when I lost uh, when I lost the SD card. Yeah, fun. All right, well that's gonna do it for episode two twenty three. More than the summer, it's parts. Thanks again to Jimmy DM ninety for that awesome idle suggestion. Everybody, stay safe out there. Don't go crazy. Uh, Till next time, this is Sean and Alex and Duke you later, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded in the Duchy on April 10th, 2020. Our theme music provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all the latest in the Duchy, go to DukesofDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Arcane Wonders and Game Toppers, LLC. You can learn more about Arcane Wonders fine titles at arcanewonders.com and learn all you need to know about Game Toppers at gametoppersllc.com. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, stay safe and game on. Game on.